Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another day of CS219, day 12. Today we are going to be talking about main memory and also about error detection and correction, specifically about Hamming code. So let's go ahead and get started. So in chapter five, we talked about the cache memory, and now we're going to be talking about main memory in general and uh, more specifically about what you know as RAM memory. So that's your, your big memory that you have. And so what is a memory made of? Well, in the most basic sense, uh, memory is, is considered to be a semiconductor memory. And while there are different technologies to basically store uh, what is known as a memory cell, so a semiconductor memory is a memory cell, and while there's many technologies uh, to, to implement this, they all share these three main properties. And they're basically being able to read into the memory, to write into the memory, and kind of to store the state as well. So what is the state of the memory? Well, you know, in computers we deal with binary, we deal with zeros or ones, but we don't specify on a computer how to store that zero or a one. Typically we use, you know, electricity to signify maybe a one and no electricity to signify a zero, but we could do the opposite. Uh, we could just as well use uh, a ball on gravity and store balls on one side or another side of a net to store a state. So a memory cell can, can basically take form in many ways. And ultimately, as long as there's two separate states that you can, that you can keep on this memory cell, then you can consider one to be a zero and one to be a one and you're in business. Uh, furthermore, it's not enough just to be able to store a state, right? You want to be able to, to read the state in the future so that you can see what was stored there. So it's very important that you can sense the state. You know, it's a better, better, better word than reading is to sense the state because whatever weird way you're storing your, your memory on, then uh, you basically need to be able to sense it. Now, what, what is the practical usage of this? And as we'll talk about later, one of the ways that you can store uh, uh, information, you know, in the memory cell, so a state, is by using electricity to charge, electric charge. You know, you can keep a capacitor and you can fill it with electricity. And if it has electricity in it, then we can consider that to be a uh, one. And if it has no electricity, then we consider that to be a zero. So you need to be able to have a way of detecting that electricity, right? And furthermore, you also want to be able to write and store something into that state. Now, with the writing, there's a little bit of flexibility because there are certain types of memory cells that you can only write once to. And there are other ones where you can write multiple times. Typically, you want to be able to read as many times as you want. Uh, unless you're like a, a spy and you know, like Mission Impossible where like the message will self-destruct after it's been read once. You know, aside from those weird cases, you want to be able to read the information more than once. However, you may not necessarily need to write more than once. For example, if you have a little embedded device that is only basically uh, doing something and that one thing and it's only going to do this one program, then there's no reason to spend more money in memory that you can write to multiple times. You just write one time to it and basically make it into a ROM, which is read-only uh, memory. And so writing, you're flexible with that. With reading, you want to be able to read multiple times. And again, the third property being to store whatever you are writing into it so you can read it later. And so um, with that said, let's go ahead and look at the different kinds of, uh, of, 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 of memories that we have. And uh, for that, we're going to turn over to the PowerPoint. So first, I actually have just to make sure that we understand a uh, picture here of a memory, a memory cell in the most basic sense. And we have the write operation and the read operation. And for the write operation, uh, basically, we have three inputs into the cell. And those inputs are, you know, the data in is basically what you're trying to store in the memory. And then on the other hand, we have the control uh, terminal, which basically indicates uh, whether we are writing or reading. So basically, you can think of a, if it maybe feeds a zero, it's in write format. And if it feeds a one, then it's in read format. So that's how you uh, basically you tell it the cell whether to switch on write mode or read mode. And if we are in write mode, uh, the ability to basically find this, uh, this cell is uh, what you're going to be using the, the, uh, 
the select, the select uh, input signal for. So select some memory cell for read and write. So that's how you pick which cell you're gonna basically be working on. And then uh, finally on the read side, the sense is basically what you're reading in from the cell. So you're sensing the state. And uh, again, select is to pick that cell as well. Um, if that doesn't make much sense, we will actually look at a typical cell structure in a second. But uh, first let's go ahead and look at the different memory types. And it's better to just look at them here than to me to write them down. So as I said, not all memory needs to be writable multiple times. And uh, here we can see that, for example, with a ROM. And, and a ROM is memory that you can only write once to, and typically that's done in a factory, and then you can't ever change it. And that includes not being able to erase it, um, and also basically not being able to uh, write more to it. So it basically becomes read-only memory. And uh, again, that is very useful when you want memory to be quick access, and also you want it to be cheap so you don't need to add the extra features to it. you basically can burn it into the chip level now you see here that there's a programmable rom and a, and a read-only rom the programmable rom are typically ones where you actually can write into it one time but that's done more at the end user level whereas a rom comes from factory already prepared and typically that you know if we think of that as an example, think of this like a clay. Uh, the read-only memory is something that in the factory, they have a mold and they stamp it and bam, you have some sort of artifact. Whereas with the programmable ROM is like a clay that when you get it, you basically are able to, uh, to sort of punch in the clay as you want, but once you punch it in, you bake the clay and then it's you know uneditable again. And so if you're prototyping something, you may want to use a programmable ROM to test it out and make sure it's exactly how you want it. And then you can use that sort of mold to go ahead and make you know, and give it to a factory to, to mass produce it, right? Because it's very expensive, because typically when you're dealing with ROM, with, with a factory that's doing ROM, they will do batches of thousands upon thousands of, 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 uh, of chips. And if something is wrong, they got to throw them all away and start over again. So they have to be very, very careful that what they're making has been like well tried and done. And you can do that by prototyping with something like a programmable ROM, you know, or, or if it's something that you're doing in small batches, it might be too expensive to make some sort of mold, so you can just do a programmable ROM. Uh, if you want to have some sort of uh, mostly, you know, read and very few writing, there's also like an erasable PROM, which is erasable programmable uh, uh, memory, and that one you actually... Uh, this is actually interesting. You use UV light to basically erase it all at once. So you have to either erase everything. You can't erase parts of it. You have to erase the whole thing. You basically bake it on light, uh, and then it basically clears it out. Uh, you and and it's not just any light. It's, it's just UV light, as the, as the chart there says. Um, and up here, I'm looking in the book. Uh, eraser is performed by shining an intense ultraviolet light through a window that is assigned into the memory chip. And you can do this multiple times. However, oh yeah, each eraser can take as much as 20 minutes to perform. So while this thing is read and write, that writing is extremely slow. So uh, uh, it's not exactly very good for reading and writing. But, uh, and it's also more expensive than PROM, but the big advantage being that you can uh, update it, you know, but those updates have to be uh, very rare because it's going to take a long time and you have to update it all at once. Like you have to basically erase the full thing and write it all again. You can't just change pieces of it. So maybe we should backtrack a little bit and talk. And, and I know we already talked about this uh, on last class, but the different memory access types. And you can see here that we see RAN here as a random access memory. Let's just make sure that we remember what random stood for. Random is basically the ability to be to access anywhere in memory that you uh, that you want. So uh, and it's quite a misused term actually because uh, all the types in this chart are actually RAM, you know, random access memory. But typically we associate RAM with the memory that we have in our computer and then like SRAM or or uh, or DRAM and those kind of things. But uh, the the real definition of this is that the random means that you can write in a constant time or read in a constant time anywhere in the memory because of the way that it's 
wire together okay uh, also it's volatile in the sense that uh, if you cut power you will lose the data and so RAM can only really be used as a temporary storage and the most popular ones like I said are DRAM and SRAM although there are newer types that we might discuss it in the lecture if you have some time and if not they're available in section 6.5 so uh, within RAM by the way uh, what does DRAM stand for that stands for dynamic RAM and uh, those are basically cells that store data as a capacitor. So let's actually talk about that. And we'll come back to this. So the two main things being DRAM is uh, it physically stores the data in a, uh, in a capacitor. Now, hopefully you guys know what a capacitor is, but uh, you know, typically those will look like a little uh, a cylinder with two wires sticking out of it. And that, you know, the, the, chemics, the, the chemistry or uh, electronics behind it is beyond the scope of this course, but you can think of it like a little tiny battery. And that battery is, I think it's made of acid or, or pretty uh, corrosive stuff. And you, the, the, the thing about the capacitor is that, you know, when you charge electricity into it, it's, it, the, the way that it works is not very linear per se. In fact, here, let me, uh, let me draw this out actually. So, you know, a capacitor, I mean, there are different capacitors, but if you look at just an old school capacitor, it'll look like a little cylinder like this. And of course, it's got two wires, which are basically what you plug to it. You know, there's like an input and an output. And when you feed electricity into it, it kind of fills it up and holds electricity for potentially a long time. And it can be very useful uh, for devices when you want to turn something on, because, uh, when you want to turn like a TV on or even a computer, you need sort of a quick burst of electricity to kind of go at once. So you can sort of use this to sort of charge it all up, kind of get it all really full and then shoot it all at once and have that quick, sharp hit of electricity. So when they uh, first introduced memory, they kind of thought of the idea of using a capacitor as a way to hold a charge. The problem is that because this is sort of a chemical composition, you know, what happens to a battery if you leave it unused for a really long time? It will slowly lose its charge, right? And so when you're looking at a graph of, of, of you charging the battery, it'll look, typically look like this. And then when you finish charging it, it doesn't just hold its battery and all of a sudden die. It typically kind of goes down like this. And that actually happens with your main memory as well. Uh, you Basically, your, your memory uh, is has to be... Uh, constantly sort of refreshed and what that means is that uh, after a while you know the charge starts to go down and here's the thing remember that the memory cell is basically just storing like a state you can bit you know hold on turn around and talk at the same time here say it's 100 percent. so when we're talking about memory cell we said that we want to store a state right so what ends up happening here is how do we detect what is a one or a zero do we detect any sort of current as a one or do we have a threshold and what ends up happening is you have a threshold so you might say like if the capacitor is around 40 percent of its charge or more we will consider that to be a one and then anything below that is a zero now why don't we just consider like you know 0.01 percent of the charge to be a one that's because like it's very hard to actually discharge this fully so if you want to open the out here it takes time for this to discharge and even if you do leave this open it's not going to ever get discharged 100%. There might be like a little bit of remains in there, just on the bottom there. And so that will discharge as well, but that will take longer in the course of potentially, who knows? Actually, uh, you know, they say some capacitors can take hours to discharge, like six hours or something like that, you know, so to fully discharge. That's why they have, they're like, be very careful when you're working with, a, with, a, with an electronic device that uses capacitors to turn on because... You, those you know you unplug you know you unplug the device from from the power outlet and then you start working on it and then you get shocked and you're like what the heck where did that electricity go you know I even push the on button on the TV or the or the motherboard to make sure that it drained the electricity well it turns out that these capacitors when you do the on button yeah they mostly empty but there's still a remainder on there and it takes time for that to also come out and so it's not very useful to just say okay we're gonna make sure that 0.1 percent means off and then 0.02 percent or higher means on because that takes a long time whereas it's a lot easier to drain a capacitor to like less than 40 percent of its capacity within like 
a very, very small amount of time, like microseconds or nanoseconds, picoseconds or nanoseconds. And so, you know, the point is that uh, you can't just make it fully empty. So you have to have a, have a threshold here, okay? And furthermore, because as time goes by, the power slowly drains out, you need to make sure that it doesn't just drain out between when you store something and when you want to retrieve it. So you need to have a, a circuitry in there, circuitry in there that constantly is refreshing your main memory to make sure that uh, that it remains basically uh, fresh enough to be able to read the data. And so uh, it's it's a little bit tricky. Also, uh, think about it. The only way that we can find out what is in this capacitor is by draining it out, right? Because uh, you know, let me put it to you this way: that here I have a capacitor. And I don't know what's in it. The only way that I can find out whether it's full or empty is to basically look inside. But to look inside, I have to open the valve which takes the electricity out. And if it takes it out, I'm like, oh, okay, there was a one. Great, but now it's empty. So GG's, we lost that data, right? Or vice versa. If we, uh, if we open it and there's nothing in it, then we're like, great, there's nothing in it. We can actually keep using it because there's still nothing in it, right? So that one is okay, but the one with the with the, whether it was full or not with the one is going to be a problem problem here. So what ends up happening is uh, with memory is basically that uh, you, when you read from it, it's a destructive process because you lose the data after you read from it. So if you're just reading from it, but you want to keep it as you typically do with memory, you know, in our RAM, if I want to access a variable, I want that variable to be accessible after I use it once, right? So what ends up happening is that process is basically a read and then rewrite process. So anytime you read from memory, you need to actually rewrite back into it the same data because by emptying the capacitor, the data is lost. And that of course takes time as well. So, uh, and, and it adds more basically, uh, makes the circuitry a little bit more complicated as well. So uh, the capacitor charge basically has to be uh, restored. And so these are these are all things that uh, that basically uh, kind of were created back in 1966 by IBM's uh, Thomas Watson Research Center, and that was when the first DRAM cell was invented. Now, what does the DRAM cell look like? Uh, it's do I, is it on the PowerPoint? Let's see. Yep, here we go. So let's go ahead and switch over to that. So the left, on the left-hand side, that's what basically a DRAM cell looks like. And that's kind of what I said. There's a transistor, an address line, and the capacitor here, and the ground where you basically take things out. And uh, as I said, basically the charges need to be refreshed as well, uh, even if you're not using it. So that means, uh, that, what that in practice means is I believe every, um, I have it written down somewhere here on, on my notes, every like 60, either every, every millisecond or every like 64 milliseconds, um, there has to be that refresh. I think it's every uh, 64 milliseconds or less, you require a refresh. So that basically means uh, what you end up doing is you don't do it all at once, you kind of stagger it, and every 7.8 picoseconds, you uh, you basically, I think that would be the uh, the time that each, each row gets refreshed approximately. So milliseconds is actually, uh, you know, consider we can actually see that if we blinked you know we we, we can see 64 milliseconds uh probably because when you're playing a game and there's a 64 millisecond ping you can you can experience a little bit live so essentially that's uh that does mean that your main memory is being refreshed potentially like you know if it was one, one millisecond every a thousand times every second but it's being refreshed uh Quite a bit, and that is to make sure that the capacitors don't basically get emptied uh, and you lose the data in there. Okay, there's that steady leakage that you have to periodically uh, uh, re basically uh, restore. And also imagine that you're refreshing when you get a request from the from the CPU for information. That basically means that the CPU has to wait for you to actually refresh the memory or finish refreshing it before you can access the data. And so uh, that that takes time as well, which makes memory slower. So yes, uh, anyways, 
So that's kind of what DRAM stands for. And uh, like I said, it's uh, something in 1966. And this is DRAM, not SRAM. But before we talk about SRAM, let's actually go back and talk uh, more about the different memory types that we have here. But I think now this makes a little bit uh, more sense now that we, we just kind of give you the idea of memory. So uh, uh, the, we have our basic RAM which as I said is electrical and the eraser happens at the byte level. So uh, not at the bit level, but at the byte level. So you can only erase eight bits at the same time at once. You can't erase one independent one. And the write mechanism is electric, electric as well because you're basically feeding these capacitors up or draining them. And it's volatile because of both. If you don't refresh the memory, that data will be gone in, in a couple of milliseconds as you can uh, see there. And also, um, uh, if, if of course you don't you, you don't even refresh it you just turn it off then the data is completely lost for sure so um, and it has the advantage you can read and write so from there we can see some other specialized ones like electrically erasable prom and flash memory so let's electrical erasable prom is just basically the same thing as, uh, as as erasable prom but instead of the UV light they do it electrically and uh, that's kind of too specialized to really talk about. The one that uh, that is more interesting to talk about is flash memory, because flash memory is what basically uh, our SSDs and USBs are practically used nowadays. And uh, in that one, as you can see, it's done at the electrical level, but it's it the eraser happens at a block level. It doesn't happen at the byte level. And so at, it, what that in practice means depends on the different uh, SSD or your USB or flash drive, but it can be like a kilobit of information has to be erased at once. And that is why even if you have a file that is less than one kilobit, it will take one kilobit fully because you can't really put two separate files in the same space because if you delete one, you would lose the other one technically. And uh, the big advantage is that it's non-volatile. As you can see, the only thing here that's volatile is the RAM. And uh, so, how can these things be non-volatile? Like how are how, how are they uh, how are they stored that basically makes them non-volatile? And that's a that's a that's a good question. I'm glad somebody asked that. So let's kind of uh, look look at how that can be achieved. And so one of the ways that uh, that that is achieved, and you can see that on page 182, is uh, it's basically at the transistor level. Or, of course, if you're looking at something like a hard drive and it's, then it's a physical level because magnets and things like that are moved. But um, where's, where's that at? I can't find it in there. There was a picture that I wanted to show, but I can't find it now. So maybe we'll come back to that afterwards when I when I get get it back again. Uh, maybe it's here. Let me see. Oh, by the way, this is actually pretty nice because it shows the different categories as well. Um, But anyways, well, I, well, I find that. Let's talk about SRAM, so static RAM, okay? So um, static RAM is actually what you have in your cache and whatnot. And those are basically flip-flops, if you know flip-flops from CPE. If not, uh, we might, I'm, I think I talked about it the other day, but I might go more in detail when we get to that chapter. If we have time, I might have to cut that chapter out from the, from the summer sessions. But uh, essentially, a flip-flop is a bunch of logic gates and or and nots that you put them in a specific order to basically maintain a state. And so by using this flip-flop and using transistors, you don't have the problem that you have with DRAM where you're using a capacitor that eventually drains out. With a, with a SRAM, as long as you have electricity currently flowing in there, um, it will hold the data as long as forever and there's no need for a refresh and also it's faster because you don't need to wait for the capacitor to drain out to be able to read what's in it you basically get it immediately and it's volatile as well because yes once you cut the power you lose the data but it is much faster but it also takes more space as well 
So, uh, and I think the here, yeah, this is the the S RAM versus D RAM. Basically, the 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 D the uh, the, the, the D RAM is faster to build, and again, it takes less space. It's cheaper. Uh, it does require the the refresh circuitry to be implemented, but even then, it's still cheaper. And uh, those are the pros. Those are basically the cons of the D RAM, but the, but basically, the S RAM is just faster. So that's of course the biggest thing. So that's basically what takes over and so yeah that's basically your uh, your SRAM versus DRAM so uh, from there uh, I had a note here oh yeah yeah so here, here this is something that I learned from from dr. Kim and that was uh, how long does memory content last and so you know, could you could you could you get information that was stored in main memory if somebody just unplugs their computer? You know, have like an FBI raid on somebody who who has some like secret information they're trying to capture, right? Or criminal information, and uh, could they get that information quickly? And so it basically turns out that uh, if you um, if because it's capacitor. Based at least on the capacitor side, uh, those capacitors, as I said, take time to empty out. And because they take time to empty out, you know, even though it, the RAM itself might read something as a zero because it's below the threshold, we can still have a little bit of electricity there. And you can use forensics to basically find that and detect which ones were set to zero or one, sometimes by hours. Uh, and how do you slow this down? You cool it down extremely. So you shoot like liquid nitrogen at the memory and you freeze it, literally, I guess, literally freeze it uh, to be able to store the data. And so uh, I have a, a, a link that uh, I don't know how I could actually uh, show that link here. Let's see if I can pull it up. Okay, so where did, did that load open somewhere? Uh, 404 link, I think. Let me try opening it on the browser manually. Uh, it's from Princeton, but the link is no longer working. But uh, it was basically about that, about them using forensics to, uh, to, uh, to basically try to, 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 to check information before, you know, before it, uh, before it fully disappears. So it's pretty cool. But yeah, so, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that if you uh, unplug your RAM and plug back in, you might get lucky. You you still have to do some interesting stuff to get it working. But uh, it's cool from that perspective that you can recover some information that way. So pretty cool. So anyways, um, let's move on here to what I'm more interested about talking about, which is error correction. Um, so here, I think I'll just use this for that. So let me find the page in here. So let me kind of introduce the idea of error correction. So a semiconductor memory system is subject to errors. And they can be categorized as hard failures or soft failures. And a hard failure is like a permanent physical defect that you might have in your computer. And uh, that, of course, is, uh, can, can be seen nowadays more often with uh, SSDs because uh, some memory types have a limitation on how many times you can write or read to something. And uh, also the environment can... Uh, can kind of play an effect when something is becoming old and not, not able to conduct electricity as good, right? So those will be kind of like your hard failures. Your soft errors or soft failures are uh, basically random and non-destructive and because means no permanent damage is done to memory. And uh, those could be like an alpha particle. That's, I think the book mentions that one, uh, which is, nowadays most things emit radi radiation to a certain extent. However, us humans, the, our skin can stop alpha particles. They can't stop beta or gamma rays, but they can stop alpha. However, we don't really have much shielding for the computer sometimes, uh, so they can be hit by cosmic rays or alpha particles and things like that and actually change the state of a bit. And so that can create an error. And of course, 
you know, if it's something that's quite critical that you're trying to maintain, like, you know, a timer that is basically going to say the next time that a machine basically like a respirator is supposed to sort of pump air into the lungs and a bit gets changed that was a counter and now instead of every two seconds to pump air in and out it's every two years or something insane then that could be very very bad right so because of that um, it's important to be able to detect errors in our code and so how can we do that well, in the most basic sense, uh, you know, let's talk about bits here. And this is going to be whether you're holding a data somewhere or you're transmitting the data. So suppose that we have the following binary code, okay? This, of course, is going to represent a two in binary, but uh, we'll just look at it as binary code. And so uh, if we want to make sure, you know, in the most naive sense, if you want to... Uh, make sure that the information that we are transmitting or storing is okay. We could store it in multiple places. We could do multiple copies. And when we talk about the different RAID architectures, or sorry, the different RAID types, we can uh, we can talk about sort of the one of the concepts is just mirroring the information, right? And then you basically compare the mirrors and hope that the error didn't happen twice, which you basically decrease, statistically, significantly decrease the chances of the error happening in the same location in two different spaces, right? Um, another way that you can do this is you can do uh, parity bits. And so parity bits are basically extra bits that you add up information. Because of course, in this way with mirroring, uh, it's nice and ideal because you can very easily, that unless, unless again, the error happens in both the, uh, the in both versions of the code, you know, odds are that it will only really happen in one of them. And so if it, you know, if, if, the, if the error happens and it flips this zero to a one, then you can compare it and easily identify that uh, that's the bit that changed. And of course, um, you, you do have a situation in this scenario where you're like, okay, which is the right answer? Like I know, oh, I circled the wrong ones. I know that the bit change, but who contains the right value? Like, is it the left one or the right one? I just know that something went wrong with this bit here, right? Like I know because here I have a zero and there I have a one, but who has the right value, you know? So that, that's, that's a bit of an issue there. Um, and so um, that's kind of bad. And also the fact that you have to keep twice the size of the information, right? So, you know, all of a sudden, if you had a one terabyte uh, SSD or you were basically 16 gigabytes of memory, now all of a sudden, because you're keeping copies of everything, you either have half a terabyte of memory or you have eight gigs of RAM. So that's pretty bad in the sense of efficiency, right? So that's not really the ideal thing. Plus, it doesn't really help you correct the error once you detect it. Uh, another sort of easy uh, way to to, the, to, to detect errors but not necessarily correct them is to use the concept of even and odd parity. So with even and odd parity, what you do is you have data. So let's say we have a bunch of data here, uh, binary data, so just random stuff like that. And what you do is you add one more bit and we're gonna call this a parity bit, piranha bit. I don't know parity bit okay and the parity bit is going to what you what you're trying to do is you're trying to come up with an even number of ones inside of your uh, your binary representation of the data and so for example here let's count the number of ones that we have we have one one here and this row we have two ones and this one we also have two ones here we have three ones here we have zero ones and just for the hex, let's add one that is everything is ones. Here we have two, four, five ones. Okay. So which of these have an even number of ones? Well, basically, this is an even number. This is an even number. This is technically an even number as well. And the other ones are odds, right? So we'll do a different color. This is odd. This is odd. And this is odd. So what you want to do is if you want to have a, a even parity, what you do is if you have an odd number of bits that are ones, this extra parity bit that you're going to add 
is going to be done so that you can now have even number of bits. So for example, in this case, we would set up a one because now we have a total of two ones, which is an even number. In this one, we already have an even number. So if we put a one, we get three bits, which is an odd number. So instead we put a zero. That way we maintain an even number. This one we also put a zero because there's also already two. This one we do put a one so that we get four ones, which is an even number. If we put a zero, we would get three ones, which is an odd number. And then in this one, we don't put anything either because zero is already even. And then this one, we do put a one so that we get six, which is an even number. So basically our information that we're going to be transmitting would be the same information as before. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero. And then zero, 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 zero. And then one, 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 one. However, in addition to that, we're going to add at the end of it, that parity bit like that. And so now, you know, you send the information over to the computer and then when it gets it, you know, it gets one at a time or you can send them all as a block, whatever. And then maybe let's say that this is the one that got changed. Okay. And maybe this one gets changed too. Okay. Cause uh, you have some, uh, what do they call it? Solar storms, you know, magnetic storms or whatever hit those bits and change them okay and so um, can you use that parity bit to detect that there's an error in the code and the answer is yes because when the system or RAM or whoever this is receiving the information what they do is they check that parity bit by making sure that it still adds up to being an even number so here we have two here we have two because these are even then we are okay However, here we have three ones. There we have a warning. And then let's look at the next one. We have four, which is an even number. That's okay. Zero, which is an even number. And here we have one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, which is an odd number. So because these are odd, we were expecting to get all even number of ones because of the even parity bit. But because these are not even, then we know that there's an error. And uh, if you've ever seen this, you might have not. You can get an error sometimes when you're installing new hardware that says NMI parity check or memory parity error. And you get like a hardware malfunction and this is like the system, the system has halted. And so this is a very nice and convenient way that's very simple and it only requires one extra bit to basically monitor that there is a bit that was changed by something. However, this does not tell you anything about the location of the error within the line you know for all you know you know you know that there's an error in this line you know that this is wrong however the error could have come from multiple places it could have come from any of the actual digits here so like this could be a one instead of a zero this could have been a zero instead of a one any of those changes would make it even furthermore the error it could be itself in the parity bit too the parity bit could have changed and then uh, you know if if the parity bit was a zero so like let's say the actual the original input was uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, just like it is up there and it has a 1 here to make it even but suppose that the parity bit is the one that actually got changed then that also says that there's an error well technically there's no error in your data the error in the parity bit will be detected as a regular error uh, you can do this exact same system with odd parity with odd parity you basically want to have an odd number so it's just going to be the exact opposite so wherever you see a one in the even bit, it will be a zero. So this will be zero, one, one, zero, one, zero. And using this along with the original input that we had. So let me actually copy and paste this into another line. So here's our original data. However, now we want to keep an odd number of ones. So here we put a zero, here we put a one, here we put a one. Here is zero, here's a one, and, and these are zero. So basically it's gonna be the exact same opposite as this. So one zero zero became zero one one, one zero one became zero one zero. Yeah. And yet again, when the computer receives it, it makes sure that uh, that the number of ones is odd in this case. Both systems work the exact same way. Um, it doesn't really matter which one you use as long as you know the, the receiving system knows which one you're using you guys are synchronized you know if you're trying to do even even parity and the receiving end is trying to do odd parity then it's going to be like what the heck everything is wrong right uh furthermore uh what can also happen is this will detect one error 
But what if there's two errors in the same line? Now, this will be very rare, but it's possible. So suppose whatever you're doing our odd parity here, and it turns out that this guy and this guy both get changed to a one. Now we have five ones, which because it's odd parity is okay. So this is even worse because like, you know, when we have one bit change, at least it tells us that there's an error. But when you get two bits changed within the same line, then there's no error. So now you're getting data that is wrong and you're not detecting the error, but you're, but you're like, oh, I have a parity bit, so it must be right. So that's very, very bad. Now that of course is a limitation of any sort of parity error checking that you do. So parity error checking has limitations. And that is one of them is that uh, no matter what you do, if, uh, if, 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 imagine this, think about it this way. You got this, uh, you got your hard drive and your hard drive has very important information. So you make 10 copies of it, right? And you keep all 10 copies in different houses. But then, then there's a fire and you lose one of the copies, right? And you're like, okay, cool. I still got nine other copies, right? But then you get this really weird, weird situation where like all the copies get burned because there's a massive solar storm or you just get really unlucky. Well, you know, if, if, you, if all, all nine others got burned out, then you're just really, really unlucky. And in that case, nobody can help you. It was your destiny to lose the data. So similarly here, parity error checking uh, even in the more advanced version that I'm about to show you, has limitations in that uh, even even though there's versions that can detect two errors and correct them automatically, uh, if you have three errors, then you're kind of out of luck. And if you have a version that kept three errors, there's always the chance that they all fail. So there's a, but the, the, you're, we're playing a rule of statistics, right? The chances of an error happening are low, but they're there. The chances of two errors happening in the same line of code are extremely low. So it's like saying you know 0.1% chance versus 0.0001% chance so those are more odds that you're, we're all willing to take us at the end of the day there's risk in just about everything right so anyways however uh, what we don't like about this simple method of, of even and odd parity is that uh, you know at least it, it, it's nice to know that there's an error but it would be nice to also be able to not just have that know that there's an error but to correct it even if it meant keeping a little bit more of uh, parity bits. And so that is where uh, Hamming distance is going to come into play. And so Hamming, uh, or sorry, Hamming distance, Hamming code, Hamming distance is something else. Uh, Hamming code. Hamming code was made by Richard Hamming at Bell Laboratories. So that's Richard Hamming. And uh, it basically kind of takes this parity uh, parity bit a little bit to the uh, to to a higher level because uh, we're gonna have more than one parity bit, and by combining them together, we'll be able to detect single errors, but not just detect them, but also automatically correct them, which is very very cool. And so uh, before I before I show you what it looks like in terms of bits because if i just go right there you're going to get lost i'm going to do the same thing the book does and show you the venn diagram example and then from there we'll work our way into actually how this actually gets stored in the computer and how you use xor exclusive or and all these things okay so this is going to be hamming code and i'd say this is the important part of this chapter and so we're going to start out with an with a uh, with an example of a four bit word. So that's four bits, okay? So we're going to call this m equals four. And so in four bits, an example of that would be something like one 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 zero, okay? So here we have a word with four bits, and what we want to do is we want to transmit this somewhere else to another machine over the internet, whatever. But of course, we want to have some parity bits added in that allow us to not just know that there's an error, but to also correct it in the scenario that there's one error. Again, the limitations of this will be for a single error. There are versions of multiple errors, but first, um, I think for, in general, I'm only going to talk about a single error. Okay, so uh, to do that, we are going to sort of create this little Venn diagram. And so... Uh, We're going to make three circles.
Actually, you know what? To make the circles prettier, I'm going to use a thing. Yeah, there we go. And then let's make one more circle. Happy circles. Okay? So, we are going to go ahead and throw in our um, word in here. So, uh, the ordering right now doesn't matter. Again, this will all come later. I'll explain it. Uh, but we'll just put it in some sort of order like that. Okay? And so now, the idea here is we're still trying to go with the whole even and odd parity idea. So, however, each of these circles should have an even number of ones. And so what we're going to do is we're going to basically fill out all the circles here. So we're going to put something here, here, and here. And those should make the circle's contents add up to one. So right now, you can see that this circle has three ones. This circle has two ones and this circle has two ones right and in terms of zeros i suppose you can see that there this circle has one zero and this one has one zero as well at the bottom okay so what do we need to add into this to make that equal to an even number of ones well we can only add we can't subtract so because we have three ones here we can add one more one and that will make this have four ones which is an even number on the other hand here we have two ones and we have one zero here so that's already an even number of ones so we can go ahead and just put a zero here to maintain the two which is an even number already oh, hello dog dog is loving right now okay finally for the bottom circle it's the same thing as the one we just did there's two ones already so we just have to put a zero here <laughs> to uh to uh keep it as a one so go back there Relax, dog. dog just woke up so doc came to say hi so uh, from there we um, we basically are, are good to go now this thing is now safe because look at what's gonna happen here if we go ahead and let's just copy and paste this so let's say we are transmitting it uh, to the machine here and let's just say that one of these bits gets hit by cosmic rays and gets changed from a zero to a one okay so when the receiving uh, signal gets it you know it's it goes ahead and checks the three circles right so first is gonna go ahead and check this one this one and this one we'll call them a b and c so it looks at a and it sees that there's four ones so it's like that looks okay then let's say it looks at b and it sees that there's three ones and now it's like alert something is wrong what could be wrong well what could be wrong here is any of the three bits that you're looking at as part of this circle so that would be this one this one or this one but it doesn't know which of the three are wrong how it's going to figure it out is by continuing to check C because it turns out that when one of the bits changes in one of the circles it will affect the other circle because every single bit is shared by at least two circles with the special one in the center being shared by all three as you can see here there's also three ones that is also a sign that something is wrong and that is a sign that something is wrong in this one, this one, or this one. So here's what we're going to use to take advantage of that. Here, let me make them half circles so you can see the colors better. We know that A is okay. You know, so if we try, so the, the candidates here are basically going to be pretty much all of them right now. But here's the thing. The one over here, this one here, this one right here. If we change that to a zero to try to fix our error, then we're going to break A because now it'll have three instead of four. And that, that would mean that that is an error there, but that's okay. So then we're like, okay, we won't mess with this one over here. So the similar thing can be said about the one up here. The one up here, this one here, if we change that to a zero like this, then this again goes to three, you know? And again, we're assuming that there's only one single bit that's messed up, right? So otherwise, you know, this whole thing breaks. But in that scenario here, because uh, because switching that to a zero would basically uh, 
Hold on. Go away, dog. Would, would basically break A. It cannot be either this one or this one that are bad because changing either of those will break A, which currently has an even number. So that basically narrows it down to being the center or this one. However, if we change the center, it will break one as or it will break A as well. So ultimately, we only end up with one possible change that we can do that will not break A. And that happens to be this one, which is the one with the error. If we go ahead and change that to a zero, then uh, we can basically fix both B and C circle and basically correct the error. So as you can see there, not only did we find out that there was an error, but we were also able to, to correct the error using the parity bits. Now, you might be thinking right now, well, hold on a second. Uh, here we had 1110, that was the original word. And then we had three parity bits, which let's just say it's 100. Zero, zero. That's almost like twice the number, twice the data, right? Yes, in this example, you are right in, in that saying that it's not exactly the most efficient system. However, there's a formula to figure out how many parity bits you need, which I'll show you in a minute here. And it turns out that uh, the more bits that you have to check, you know, it doesn't mean that this thing will grow linearly. It actually, this grows as powers of two. So you can have a lot of more bits and you don't need as many parity bits. So while this is sort of the bottom of that where they're almost equal, as we go up on the number of bits that we have in our word, the parity bits don't go up that quickly. And so uh, it turns out that this is actually a pretty nice and efficient way of detecting single errors uh, in, in, in any sort of communications, in, in, in our case with main memory. And so now you're thinking this whole Venn diagram thing makes sense, but then if you read the book, then you started seeing what they did afterwards and then you got lost. And that's okay. That's what I'm going to try to go ahead and, and sort of explain next. For a minute. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and figure out how this actually happens, sort of uh, algorithmically per se, because there's no Venn diagrams in the computer that we can see this, right? And so uh, the way this actually happens is it uses an XOR table. Um, so let's first make sure we remember what that is. So XOR means exclusive OR. And what that means is that we have an A and a B, and then we have our output, and you know the possible combinations are zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. I guess being a purist, we should probably put put it the other way around, like that. And what this returns is basically zero when they're equal, and then ones when they are different. So if if A and B are equal, whether it's a zero, zero, or a one, one, it basically returns a zero. If they're different, then it returns a one, okay? And that's gonna be very useful right now for this parity bit checking stuff. So how do we represent the previous example with parity bits? And so what we're going to do is uh, we are going to list out all of our uh, bits here in a little table that we're gonna make. So let's go and make that. Okay, let's try that again. I guess I hesitated too long when I was making it. There we go. Okay, and we're gonna do this by bit position. Okay, and the way we'll do this is we'll count, I, I don't know why the book likes to do it backwards, but I'm gonna put it forward. So we are going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because that's the, the amount that we had up here, right? We had seven of these. Four, three, uh, three for the parodies and four for the data. And then we'll do an example with, uh, with eight, okay? And so now, the next thing that I'm gonna do here is I'm, oh, you know what? Actually, let's make this wider. Otherwise we will, uh, we'll, we'll get it too cramped. So maybe like zero, one, two, three, four, five six and actually that's it yeah because uh, it counts from zero so yeah let me turn my oh, okay very hot so okay now we're going to put that in binary equivalent okay so we're going to put the binary equivalent of those numbers so uh you should all pretty much know that 
but I'll put it in here. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and finally 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay. Uh, actually, you know what? We should probably, to make this work better, let's start counting from 1. Because then, then I'll, I'm going to show you a pattern that will actually make this like 10 times easier. So, yes. I know CS people, we like counting from 0. But with Hamming code, it actually makes your life so much easier if you count from, um, from 1. And the reason why is because when it comes time to remember where the parity bits go, because they have to go in a specific spot for all of this to work, is they will go wherever there's only a one and everything else is zeros in your binary equivalent. So what that means is that this guy, this guy, and this guy are all going to be your parity bits. So, or we can call them check bits as well. That's another term for that. That's the one that your book uses. So, check bits. Okay? And so, there are, though, again, the way that I'm looking at that is that, that everything else, as you can see here, is zeros, and then we have a single one in there. You see that? And, surprise, surprise, if we had an extra parity bit, because this was a bigger word, then the next one would be on spot 8, because then the next binary would be one zero zero right and that's just a single one so every time that you have a uh, a single bit that's a one and everything else is zero you're going to make that be a check bit okay and so uh that's an easy way to remember and that's why it's better to, to do this starting from one okay uh also i guess you could probably get the idea that powers of two also make you the uh the check bits so if you do power of two to the uh K, where K is the number, this is the uh, the word that you have. You know, you could basically say that two to the zero is equal to one, two to the one is equal to two, two to the second is equal to four, and then two to the three would be equal to eight, which happen to be all of the places where your check bits would be. Again, if the, if this was a bigger word, we would have a check bit here, which we will in this example later. So again, that's a very useful thing to to remember. And what that also means is that the remainder of the uh, the, the remainder of the bits are going to be your data bits. So that would be this one, this one, this one, and this one. And typically, you will see uh, you will see check bits in the beginning, and then and then you will see data, and then you'll see check bits, and then the gaps will become bigger and bigger because, as you can see here, the next check bit, if we had a check bit on spot eight, could basically protect us for uh, quite a few more bits. So again, well, you'll see that in a second. Right? Let's go slow. So here, this is going to be basically data one, data two, data three, and data four. So in our case, you know, if we have the uh, one one zero, that's the one that we were doing, right? Yeah, one one zero. Then it would be something like one 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 zero. Okay, that's what we have here. And then the check bits for for um, for these three, which are going to be the outside circles, are going to basically depend on uh, on the other bits of the Venn diagram, right? But to convert this into actual systematic way of doing this is we are going to be using. I think I think there's a picture on the PowerPoint that I can show you for that. Yes, I think this one might help. Actually, no, that's probably going to confuse you. So let me just actually just go from, from my own personal side. So what you're going to do is the position of the bit that is a one in the check bit is the one you're going to compare to any other one that has a one in it already. Okay, so let's... Uh, let me just copy and paste this down here just so I can uh, so I can mess with it and I'll leave this one be clean. So 
Yeah, because otherwise I feel like you you get lost. You can read the book's example, and if the book makes sense to you, then you know you you do you. But if not, then I'd like to propose to you an easier alternative. And so let's look at the location of the check bits. As you can see, they're all in different spots, right? That's just how binary works. Here we have it as the first, sort of like as the first significant digit. Here it's the second one, and here it's the third one, right? And then if there was a fourth check bit, it'd be in the fourth spot, and so on. So the ones that are related to this, so in your Venn diagram, the, the this is like the out, these are, uh, the, this check bit is gonna be connected to this guy here, this one, and this one. And those are the, the ones where this bit is a one. So that's gonna be this one, this one, and this one, because that has a one, right? Um, as you can see, the uh, other data bit, which is uh, this one here, does not have a one. So that one is not part of the Venn, of this circle's Venn diagram. Furthermore, no other check bits will ever be part of those Venn diagrams because you can see the the whole concept of how making the check bit be the the only one in the in the sys in the uh, in the bit binary representation is that everything else is a zero, right? So it's impossible for there to be a one. You will never have a situation where the binary representation of a check bit is like more than one in there. It's always going to be a bunch of zeros, and somewhere in there is going to be a one, somewhere in there, but just one single one, and that's the one that you can use to share. So in this case, you know, for the first check bit, it's going to be, if we, if we do the Venn diagram equivalent of this, so let me put that beneath us here. That's sort of the location of each one, is if we consider this to be check bit one, so I'll call this C1, then these three circles here would be check bits two, four and seven okay now i haven't explained as to where two four and seven go that all makes sense in a minute here but basically the number of ones that are in the binary representation is how many how many circles they share together so as you can see uh here the three has two ones so it shares between two circles and then for example, uh, the five has two ones, so it shares between two circles. The six has two ones, so it's again shares between two circles. But the seven has three ones, so it's gonna be shared between three circles, which is why I put it in the center, okay? And again, I'll do an example with more bits so that you can see with a bigger circle how that also affects it. So now, my question to you is, which uh, data bits are going to be used or checked by the second check bit okay now i'm going to take a five second pause here but if not just pause the video and think about it for a minute and then uh when you're ready to go on pause it so i'll drink water while you do that okay welcome back from your pause if you paused it if not then i just drank water so from there because again, this is the second significant bit is the one that set as one. We're gonna look at the rest of these and anywhere where we have that second bit set as one is gonna be part of it. So that is actually gonna be this one because it has a one here. It doesn't matter what anything else is, we're just looking at that bit. This one is not because it has a zero. This one is not because it has a zero. This one is because it has a second a one there and this one is because it has a one in there. So basically we have our three bits right there. So if we want to put that in the Venn diagram, then um, uh, let's see which one it would be of the two, actually. Uh, so it would be, well, let's see. It shares, it does not share a four, so it can't be this one because otherwise it would share the four. So it has to be the top one then. Okay, so it has to be the top one. So it's going to be check bit two. And again, it shares a, it has the, um, I put a two here. I think I meant to put a three there. Uh, earlier actually uh yeah yeah i don't know why i put a i put a damn it why did i put a two here i meant to put a three should be in the three wow i put i don't know why i put all these all, all these numbers in. it was supposed to be a five here too i don't know how that happened let's go back to that for a second here uh apologies for that so again check bit one we're looking all the all the ones that have a one in the first digit and that is actually uh that's i i circled them i circled the three i circled the five and i circled the seven but for some reason i put different numbers in there than what i actually circled so i don't know where that went wrong but three five and seven okay so anyways looking at the two uh, the check bit two we said that three 
um, six and seven are the ones that are, 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 are shared for check bet two. So we got the three and the seven here, so we're just gonna put in the six here. So finally, we're gonna look at check bet three, which is over here. And again, that is going to be the third significant addition. We're gonna look at all of them. Although what you will find out is because of how binary works, you never have to look behind the check bit because anything, if you're, if you're doing your counting in uh, increasing order here, it's impossible for that to be a one in the third position in any of these, right? Cause uh, you know, it'd be, a, it'd be a bigger number than these. So you really only have to check this way. So uh, that's a nice little hint. So anyways, because of that, you know, we can see that this has a, a one in there, this has a one and this has a one. So for all three of those, we can essentially say that they are going to be part of check bit three. And as you can see here, we already have them there, five, six, and seven. But again, we don't even need the Blaze's Venn diagram. We're strictly using this now. I'm just showing you the comparison with the Venn diagram so you can make the connection. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's 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 how you uh, how you how you basically put this in. Now, how do you actually do the checking? So how do you do the counting whether things are even or odd? For that, we're going to use the XOR. So let me go ahead and copy this one again. That's more clean. What we're going to do. I guess I should have written those down is uh, we're going to XOR together all of the shared stuff in the circle. So basically we're going to XOR all those four together and then we're going to XOR in color here, all of these together and us doing an XOR of all of them together is going to basically do the same thing as checking whether it has it even or odd. And that's just a property of when you're XORing things because think about it. Do an example without even looking at anything. So if we have the following combination, this is odd, right? If we have something like this, that's even. And then let's just do one more where everything is one. So that's even as well. Okay. Now maybe we do one like this. Yeah, odd. The symbol for XORing, the typical symbol that people use is a little plus sign with a circle around it like that. And so if you want to represent this as XORing, you can do it like this. So one 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 zero would be put like that. In fact, maybe I should space these out more so I can throw in all those XOR symbols there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little handy dandy XOR and just throw it in all of these like that. Okay? And so how you do that is you basically look at these and XOR that. So what is that? X XOR. Well, XOR again gives you a one if you have these situations. So this gives you one. And then if you have zero, zero, or one, one, it gives you a zero. It's called exclusive or. So this would give us a zero, right? Because of that. So then, you know, we simplify it. Uh, well, actually, I want to keep the original one. So here, let's write it down right here. So one, 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 zero, okay? So let's simplify that by removing all of that and putting the answer in. So you get a zero there. Now we're gonna XOR a zero or a one, okay? So a zero or a one should give us a one. So we're gonna simplify this then and put a one in there. And finally, we have a one and a zero, which gives us a one. So as you can see, an odd number of, of ones gave us a one there. And that's actually gonna be your symbol. When we do the XORs, if we get a one after we do all the XORing together, that means that there is an error, okay? So this one should not, the second example here should not give us an error because it's even. So let's find out. So let's XOR it together. So first we do this XOR here, the one and the zero. That, looking at our chart here, gives us a one. Then we got one, one. That in our chart gives us a zero. And then zero, zero is gonna give us a zero. That, of course, means that there's no error because it's even. So, I, well, a zero means no errors and one means error, okay? But the fact that we got a zero is a sign that it was an even number of ones. So this is an even number of ones as well, the next example. So this should give us a zero when we XOR all together. 
Let me just show you that it will, I guess it's not a good example to show you, but it doesn't matter which direction you go with the XOR, it'll give you the same result. So uh, maybe for this one, I'll start from the end. Here it's all one, so <laughs> it really doesn't matter which direction. But uh, yeah, so from there, the one one is gonna give you a zero. And then the, the zero one would give you a, uh, a one. And then the one one would give you a zero. And then you're good. But even if, like, let's say right there, like right here, we did the one one here, which gives us a zero, and then we decided to maybe do this one, which is one one, that would also give you a zero, and then you'd have zero zero left, which would give you a zero. So it really doesn't matter which direction you run these. But I just just be consistent and run them from left to right, just so you don't make mistakes. You know, find your pattern and just follow it. So finally, this last one should give us a one because it's an odd number. So let's find out. So zero zero with the x is just going to give us a zero, so that takes care of that, and then it's going to give us a another zero between that, and then zero one will give us a one. So that is indeed an error sign. So there we go. Cool. So that's good practice about XORing. So now what we have to do with our thing here is just that we have to XOR basically all of the uh, bits that are matched for each thing. So let's go ahead and do that. So right now, of course, we do, we haven't introduced any errors. So uh, basically, we should. Uh, oh, uh, what I haven't shown you yet actually is uh, throwing in the values that we need to put this to XOR in with. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we haven't gotten there yet. So this is how you XOR things, right? But uh, what we need to do is we need to make sure that uh, the XORing that we did here. You know, we want to basically throw that in as the check bit itself as well. And the reason why is because when we XORed something that was odd, we got a one back, right? And so here's here, let me let me point something out. So like for example, um um what were these? I, I forgot. Let me see. Backtrack. Okay, so we had this zero zero one, right? So when we XOR this, we got a one out of it, right? Because zero zero gives us a um, a one, or sorry, a zero, and then zero zero gives us zero one, and then zero one gives us a one. So yeah, so then we get a one out of that. So here's the thing, though, if we XOR the answer to this, so if we add to the zero 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 one one, we if we add in the extra bit that we just got from the XORing as a result, and then we XOR that result. So let's go ahead and XOR this together now. Look at what we get. The zero zero there, you know, looking at our chart gives us a zero which leaves us with, uh, well, here, let's just make life easy. If you just put a bunch of XORs, so 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, okay? So what we're doing is we're taking our original value that we just XOR before, and then we're adding in the result of the XOR that we already just did, okay? So this will give us a 0, this part. Then this will give us another 0, and then the zero one will give us a one and then the one one will give us a zero so here's the thing when you take an input and you xor that input you if it's even you get a zero and it keeps the thing even it keeps the number of bits even out with a zero added but if you xor an odd number and the result is a one which it will it will be and then you XOR that result together, it all of a sudden becomes even because you just added a one from the result. So we're gonna use both XOR to create the check bit and then also to verify that the check bit didn't get lost, okay? So that's what we're gonna do next. So uh, now we can proceed to this bottom part. So, so far, all we really have done is just basically figure out which bits are parity or check bits and which were his data. But now we gotta fill in the data for them. So what we're gonna do is, we're, let's go ahead and do check bit one first, okay? So check bit one, we know that that check bit, you know, for one, and I guess we'll actually write them down this time. So check bits one, two, and three, which check bits do they relate to? Again, we were using the location of the one there, so because the one is in the first significant digit there, then we're gonna look at all the ones that have that as a, as a value. So that is three, five, and seven because six has a zero there so it doesn't count okay two on the other hand 
has that there, so that means it has three, it has six, and it has seven. Because five has a zero right there, so it doesn't count. Check bit three, uh, which is actually this one here, has five, six, and seven in it, okay? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take those values and we're gonna XOR them together. So let's see what they get, what they are. So three, five, and seven are basically one, one, and zero, because that's three, five, and seven. So three, five, and seven. Then three, six, and seven are one, one, zero. And then five, six, seven are one, one, zero. Huh. We all we got the same for all of them. That's funny, but it's okay. So now, to be able to figure out what the check bit is, we're gonna just XOR them together. So what is the result of the XOR? Well, here let's go ahead and put our XOR table here. So again, zero, one, and one zero will return a one, and then zero, zero, and one one are gonna return a zero. Okay. So that means that one one here on the first row, this here will return us a zero. And then zero zero together will return to us a zero. So the result of this is a zero of this XOR. And that is what we're gonna put in check bit one. Okay? Next we got uh and well I guess as you can see they're all gonna be the same thing because they're all the same value. So all three of these, that first XOR is gonna give us a zero. And then zero zero is going to give us a zero again. So they're all actually going to be zero in this case. That's that's kind of funny. It's okay. So uh, ultimately, we got ourselves the data that we're going to transmit, which is zero zero one zero one one zero. So we transmit that. Okay. So let's go ahead and transmit it by just copying and pasting it. And we're transmitting it to two devices. Say we're transmitting it to main memory but also we're transmitting it to like, I don't know, the hard drive, okay? And guess what? When it was going to the hard drive, again, uh, there was some cosmic storm or alpha particles, who knows what, it actually went ahead and changed this five to a zero, okay? And then the main memory, it's okay. So first, main memory is gonna check it, review it, so I'll put this down here so we have space. So main memory is gonna get the information and is gonna first verify, and we already know ahead of time that it's correct, but the main memory doesn't. So let's go ahead and run to the verification process to make sure that there is no error, okay? So the way that we are going to verify that there's no error is that we are going to XOR all of the bits. So again, we can get the same information here that we did before. So again, we match each check bit with its appropriate bits, which again is based on the location of the one. So again, check bit one gets matched with positions uh, three, five, and seven. Check bit two gets matched with positions three, because of that, five, or check bit, sorry, six, and then seven. And then check bit three, which is this one, gets matched with this, this, and this, okay? So we're gonna pull that information and we're gonna put it here. So we're gonna put in zero, because that's the value of check bit one. I guess these are all gonna be the same, right? Because we saw that earlier, so three, five, and seven, and then this is also zero, and this happens to be three, six, and seven. So yeah, these are all gonna be the same, but that's okay. And now, to verify that we did not have any data errors when we were transmitting, we're basically gonna XOR those values together. So again, here, because they're all the same, we are essentially just gonna do one of them, because you would do it for, one, for each of them, because they're usually different, but here they just happen to be the same. Just uh, lock it a draw, I suppose. Okay, so now for this one, when we do the XORing, this here is going to give me a one. So I'm gonna end up with one, one, zero. And then here, I am going to get zero because it matches. And then finally I get this one and that is going to give me a zero. And because I got a zero there, that means that there is no error. 
furthermore when I do this for all three of these you know for check bits one two and three so one two and three I'm gonna get zero for all of them because I got a zero for all of them I can guarantee that there is no error in this message now let's go ahead and do the same thing for the one that the hard drive got which I introduced the error to so now in this one here you will see that things will change so go ahead and copy this here however when I repopulate this this time it should look different I think so let's do three five and seven so three is a one well we're for this is the check bit so the check bit here is zero zero and zero okay but now three five and seven are going to be one zero zero because those three five and seven are that value then three six and seven are one six is one and seven is zero and then five six seven is zero one zero so here we actually got all different which is nicer because i can show you more examples of that so yeah so let's go ahead and do all the xoring for this so let's start out with c1 so that is basically that make sure i didn't make any issues typos zero one zero zero so this xor zero one is going to give me a one and so i end up with here it might be so you just crack this down like that and then from there i go ahead and xor that as well and that's going to give me another one And I have this left and that of course is going to give me another one so already here I know that there's an error but let's keep going okay because I want to show you something very cool that's going to happen here so the first value so we got c1 you could say it gave us this value okay so let's go ahead and do c2 and c3 so c2 we're going to XOR these together so we get, by the way, let me make triple check that I didn't make any typos here. So zero, 01 gives us a 1, and then 10 gives us a 1, and then 10. Okay, cool. I'll make a typo, then this whole thing won't work. So yeah. Okay, so zero, 01, that is going to give me a 1, and then I have left the 1 and the 0. So this is going to give me a 0, the 1, 1, and then I have left that and that, and then this is going to give me a 0. Okay? So this one's okay. This one says that there's no errors. So we'll save that one. Finally, we're gonna do the check bit three. Okay, so we'll do that one next. So that one, we are going to do zero x or zero x or one x or zero 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 is going to give me zero um, and then we have one and then we have zero then zero one is going to give me one and then one zero is going to give me one so that is an error as well so that basically means that check bit three gave us a one so now let's put them all together okay so let's actually just put them side by side here So we got three, we got two, and then let's bring one in as well. Okay. And uh, interestingly enough, let's go ahead and put this sideways. One, zero, one, okay? Now, let's go ahead and look at our thing here. Our chart that has the error in it. Notice something interesting here about this. The one, zero, one that we got is not just a random number. I mean, we can see the fact that we got ones instead of all zeros, it means that there's an error. But more importantly, the 101 is actually the location of the error. 
This one zero one is one zero one here. And guess what? That's exactly what we changed. And because we know that's the location of the error, all you gotta do at that point is just flip that back to a one. So then the original message was this. Which, if we look at the OG thing here, you know. Undo. <coughs> you can see that that was indeed the original message. So not only did we detect the error, but we also were able to correct it because we magically got, well, not magically, but at least it looks magical. It doesn't, the XOR operations that we did don't just tell us, they're not just to tell us whether there's a one. I mean, of course, if this is all zeros as we got in the first thing that we did here with the, the first example, then it means that there's no error. But if there's a number there that's not a zero, it's not just any random number you're getting. You're actually getting the location of the error once you solve all the checkpoints. And so it's no coincidence that we got a 101 here and that it matches where the error is. It's actually part of the design. It's not a bug, it's a feature. So uh, this is actually known as the syndrome. So this result that we have when we did the XOR on the parity bits and everything else, on the, on the XORing the check bits and the, and the, uh, parity, and the uh, regular data bits is known as the syndrome. And the syndrome is always going to be the size, potentially the number of bits will give you the size of everything together, including the, the length of the data bits and the check bits. And essentially, if you get a zero with the syndrome, it means there's no error. But if you get something other than a zero, like we did, because we got 101, that actually indicates the location of the error. And therefore, all you got to do to fix the error is at that location, run that to a not gate. So if there's a zero, switch it to a one. And if there's a one, switch it to a zero. And then you can run your parry check again, and you will find out that there's no more an error. So it will correct it for you. So that's pretty cool. And that's really the powerful thing about using this Hammond code version instead of just using the uh, the odd pair that I showed you in the beginning. Okay. Uh, however, um, uh, this will not work if there's more than one error. If there's more than one error, then two things can happen. One of them is it corrects the wrong thing, or it just assume, it just doesn't detect an error at all. And it just says everything is fine. So, uh, yes. Also, there's another interesting thing here that will happen. Let me do one more example with this before I switch over. Uh, if the error, by the way, I guess I'll, I'll, no, I won't, I won't spoil it. Let's just do it. So let's run ahead and run another error here. And I mean, this is kind of obvious, but it's also nice to point out. So I believe this is the original one. So let's go ahead and introduce one more scenario here where the error that we're going to introduce is actually going to be one of the check bits themselves. So let's say that this zero becomes a one. Okay. In fact, I'll do it like this. So I know it became a one. So if we go ahead and we'll do all our check bit stuff again, um, I guess sort of, let me copy this go faster. So I know which ones are supposed to go to which one. So, uh, this right here, If we go ahead and put all those values here, we know that this is always gonna be one, one, zero because we checked that. So three, five, seven, and then three, six, seven. Yeah, they're all gonna be one, one, zero because everything is correct actually there. However, the check bits themselves, are the one that is gonna change is this one, right? This change. So we know that when we XOR this, this will give us a one here, then a zero, and then a zero. So this two will give us a zero, okay? However, this one here, when we do the XORing, let's go ahead and do that one. So well, this will give us a zero, and then this will give us a one, and then this will give us a one, right? So we get a one there. So the final result of all of this is we get zero, zero, one. And if we look at this, zero, zero, one.
Ah, okay. So, we get a 0, zero 1, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, this is pointing out and saying that the error is here, right? But it's not. It actually turns out that you have to invert the location of this thing. So, flip it around to find the real location of the error, which is the check bit here. However, as a rule of thumb, if you only get only one one when you're running your parity bit checking, when you're doing this checking, if you only get a one and everything else is a zero, then you know the error is in the check bit and you don't have to worry about that. You can just regenerate new check bits. You don't have to manually correct it. Um, and that's frankly going to be the better thing instead of flipping things around. Okay. But, uh, yeah, in fact, I think let's, let's, let's do one more example. Uh, let's go ahead and do, um, let's do one where it changes to three to a one. Because uh, I want to make sure that we don't have to flip it in another scenario. Because we did get some, we did get a palindrome when we did this, so it's a small possibility that we might have to do that. So I want to make sure that I am not remembering that wrong. But I, I do know that for for the parity bit, um, you know that it's a parity bit that's an error because if you look at the the result, it's all going to be zeros and there's only one one in there, and then that way you can just know it's a parity bit error, no problem. Okay. But I don't know if you have to, I don't remember now if I have to invert it for also for the regular one. So let's try it on, on, on this one. So let's see if we actually get zero one that, or if we get one, one, zero, because that's, that's when we'll know if we also have to invert it for this one. Okay. So, uh, let's go ahead and run it on that. So in this scenario here, uh, everything is one, one, zero, but this check bit here. We switch that to a one. Ah oh, no, we switch this one. We check three. Okay. Did we not? Oh, I see. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Great. So uh, in this scenario here, this was a zero, but the one that got changed is going to be this one and this one. Okay, so this is, will now become zero for both of these. So we get zero, one, zero, and then for this one we get zero, one, zero, and then this one we get zero, we got one, one, zero. Okay, cool, perfect. Okay, so this one we already know will give us a zero, right? So, yeah, okay, so it's going to flip it. Perfect. Okay, cool. I'm glad I did this. So, okay, so now when we do the XR for the other two, then uh, let's go ahead and do that. So this will give us a one, or sorry, this will give us a zero. And then this will give us a one. And then this will give us a one. So yeah, so we're gonna get one, one, zero. So this will give us one, one, zero. So you do also have to flip it. It just turned out that we had a palindrome. But when you get the error bits, you, when you get your C1, C2, and C3, and you get one, one, zero, what you have to do at that point is flip it around like that so actually when we did this one here you know this actually matched even if we didn't flip it because this is a palindrome right because if we flip this we also get 101 but uh in this one this would have been more of an obvious scenario because you can see here that the error is actually on this bit here right zero one one but we actually got one one zero. So you have to invert it for correction always. Okay, always invert it for correction. Not just with the check bits, okay? So I'm glad I caught that. So as, lo as long as you do that inversion, then the result of the XORing will give you the location of the error. So just flip it up back, okay? So that's pretty much the lecture. Um, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and do another example. So if you're good to go, then you don't have to stick around. But if you want to get another example of Hammond code, 
now we're gonna go ahead and do one with uh, more bits so uh, I'm gonna try not to I'm gonna try to pick something that is not in the book so just pick random numbers here basically so what we're gonna do is first of all I guess before you go one last thing I want to tell you is how you compute how many how many um, how many bits you require for that and there is a table in the book for that this one and it, it tells you approximately how many check bits you need for this and I'll tell you the formula in a second because that they don't tell you that up here in PowerPoint but uh, as you can see if you have eight bits of data you'll need one more check bit so already there you can see that like before you know with four bits of data we needed three check bits which is almost like twice the size right but by the time that you get to eight bits of data you only need half of that and that goes down basically halving each each time you double the number of bits by the time you get to 64 bits you can see that you only need seven check bits which represents about 11 percent increase in the uh in the size of this and that's really cool because you know it's not that much of an increase by the time you get to 256 bits of data you only need nine check bits and that's only three percent more and for that three percent of extra sp space potentially you are able to correct one bit of error so that's very 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 good and that is why it's very popular to use so anyways the formula for uh being able to to figure this out is going to be 2k minus 1 1 actually the 1 is actually outside of the exponent has to be greater than or equal to m plus k with m being your data bits and k being your check bits okay and so basically if you want to uh, if you want to find out how many check bits you need then you can just plug it in and testing so like for example let's say that we have 16 bits that we need okay or yeah let's pick an arbitrary number let's pick 18 no 28 let's say we have 20 bits of data okay we want to find out how many check bits we would need for this so what we do is we make 28 plus k has to be 2k minus 1 okay has to be less than or equal to so suppose that we go ahead and we pick 5 as our check bits okay so we make 5 then it would be 2 to the fifth minus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 28 plus 5 28 plus 5 is equal to 33 and then 2 to the fifth is equal to uh 2 to the third is 8 16 32 so 32 so 32 can't draw that 32 minus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 33 as we can see that is false so that means that we need one more check bit probably so let's try 6 so k equals to 6 so if we do 2 to the 6 minus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 28 plus 6 which happens to be 34 and then 2 to the 6 is probably going to be 64 so 64 minus 1 is going to be equal to 63 so 63 is greater than 34 so then we're good to go that basically tells us that we need at least well we just need five we or sorry six we don't need more if we did more so like suppose we need seven check bits then 2 to the 7 minus 1 is greater than 28 what well, was 20 right plus 7 28 plus 7 is now going to be 37 or sorry 37 35 and then 2 to the 7 is going to be i'm going to guess 128 minus 1 is 127 so this still holds so that means you could have if you really want to you could have seven uh k bits however why it's a waste at that point so really six is good enough and six would actually get you as far as having up to 63 bits of data uh or actually no let, let, so it would get you whatever uh 64 minus six is so i suppose 58 bits of data would, would basically be a, how many the maximum number of bits you could have and and have six check bits by the time you get to seven check bits then you could have basically uh 
whatever, 120, whatever you, whatever you have, uh, 7 minus 127 would be. So 100, you have up to 120 bits of data for that. So you can see it's going up pretty much. That's why, you know, by the time you get, I think it was to 256, you only need nine check bits and that's only 2% increase. So uh, it's very, very nice. And, and by the way, there is a double error correction system that again, I really don't talk about, but you only need one more bit to be able to do that. And so um, that's actually very, uh, very nice as well. So actually, no, my, my apologies for that. Single error correction, but double error detection. How does that work actually? So yeah, let's do that one before you guys, before you guys go, if you're not gonna watch the bigger, longer example. So for that one, I think I have uh, an example here. So double error detection. What you have to do for that one is if you go back to the Venn diagram, we have a Venn diagram somewhere here. The way that you can have double error detection is you have one more bit here for even or odd parity. So you count the total number of ones in the entire, on, in all circles. So we have, we have one, two, three, four ones. And then if it's even, then you just put a zero. If it was odd, so if you had an odd number of ones in here, then you'd put a one, okay? And so essentially, if you keep track of that, then um, if there's an error, you, you can basically, um, you can count the number of odds or even. So if two things change, so like, for example, if, if there's one error, we know we, we can fix that, right? So like, if we, if we I guess I don't want to, I don't want to break this example. So maybe copy paste it here. So if we go ahead and change, for example, this to a one, we can detect that as an error, right? But if this also changes to a one, you know, or actually, uh, Uh, but then we detect an error down there. Uh, so maybe we don't change that one to a one. Maybe we change. There's no easy way to do this. I suppose that we can change. Yeah, we, we'll change both of these. Why not? So we'll change this one to be. We'll keep this one at zero. But we'll change this to be one and one. Okay. So then, uh, if you were to feed this in, you know, what the algorithm might say is like, oh, the error must be in here. So let me go ahead and switch this to a one, right? That's what the algorithm would tell us to do. And that's of course wrong to do because uh, that's, that's bad. You know, that would be an incorrect correction per se because that's two errors. So what's gonna happen there if this happens is that when you do this one, two, three, four, well, no, this this would still be zero here. So you have two errors. You have this one change, and then you have this one change, right? Because you can see they changed to ones. So the error correction would switch that to one. But before you even do the error correction, what ends up happening is you count the number of ones you have. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And so you have six of those. And then when you do the error correction, that becomes a one. You have seven total, okay? And because here you had a zero because it was supposed to be even. Now all of a sudden to make it even, this would have had to be a one, right? To make this even. So then you would say, oh, okay. That means there's more than one error because our overall even parity bit is basically broken. So just a little fun fact for you guys to know uh, about double error detection. You just have to add an extra bit that keeps track of whether things are even or not. And then if you do get something wrong and then you run it to the error detection, the Hamming code, and then you fix it, and then you check the number of bits in total and it doesn't match to what you had before because it's now odd instead of even, then uh, you know that actually it was a double error. At that point, you can basically see something really bad happened, guys. But at least I know it happened. I don't know how to fix it, but I know it happened. And that just costs you one extra bit, no matter the size of this. So, okay. So now we're really done. So now you guys can, uh, you don't have to watch the rest of the video. But for those of you that want the extra example, I'm gonna go ahead and do one a little bit bigger with other numbers, just so you can have another example. And then uh, that will be the end of the video. So you don't have to stick around for that if you uh, if you got this. If you didn't, then I'll see you guys next time. If not, then 
hang in there we'll do another example and hopefully this time you get it so uh, for the next example we are just going to make this a little bit bigger um, so let's go ahead and add like more data like that okay so let's go ahead and make our string that we're going to check be 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay. All right. So maybe put a 1 here and 0 here. Try not to make it symmetric. Okay. So we have potentially 5 bits. Okay. So because we have 5 bits here. And there's an example in the book with 8 bits. So that's why I'm not going to do 8 bits. But uh, I will do five because that will require a bigger Venn diagram. Actually, technically, yeah, yeah, yeah. How would this look like in the Venn diagram? This would look like this. It's kind of hard to draw. like that maybe this circle would be nicer to be smaller but it doesn't really matter I guess I'll try to make it smaller this way okay so each circle has basically four things they share I think. let me uh, I have a Venn diagram that I drew the other day that I can actually use to make sure that I didn't goof that up. So, no, 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 I did goof it up. I don't want this circle to be touching. I don't need that many circles to touch. So here, let me move these back up a little bit, actually. So I actually need each of them to have four things inside. So... Okay, so I think what I'll do is I'll make this here like this. And then like this. Yeah. Okay. I think that that uh, I think I have too many bits now. I have one, two, three, four five six seven I have seven but I don't need seven so eh, I guess uh, I guess I can draw I can I can take this one out but I do want them to share at least one thing in between so it's kind of tricky to do we can just put we can just make him zero or something to uh, to get it to get it good so uh to be able to get that extra check bit either way uh let's let's not worry about the venn diagram because i can't draw that's just too complicated let's just stick with the the, the actual representation that we have here because that's actually what matters so yeah so ultimately uh in this one we have one one zero one so again where are check bits going to be check bits are going to be wherever we have the binary just with one 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 and then it, and then everything else zeros so in this scenario, it actually turns out to be uh, to be basically powers of two, as I said earlier. So maybe I can shrink this a little bit. There we go. And then data-wise, this would be your data five. Okay, and so we can plug them in one, one, zero, one, zero. Okay, now we can go ahead and generate our check bit data, but we first we have to figure out who matches with what. So, because we have four check bits, we need to basically see what they will do. So, again, 
to see who matches what check bit, you look at the binary uh, one in it. So basically, the first check bit will match all the ones that have a one in front of it. So that is going to be uh, three, five, seven, and now nine, because nine has a one right here. So yeah. Uh, three, five, seven, and nine. Cool. So basically, uh, two doesn't apply, four doesn't apply, six doesn't apply, and eight doesn't apply. So perfect. Check bit two is for the second digit. So, and again, you never have to go backwards. It's never going to be the case. So, like, I can already tell you ahead of time that check bit four can only have one one option here that you could put, and that is basically nine. It cannot. It's impossible for it to basically have a to have uh, anything before it, so that's just gonna have that. The other one should have the same number, so that one's gonna be kind of interesting. Actually, uh, not, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Check bit two, we'll have uh, three, we'll have six, seven, and I think that's it, right? Because uh, three, four doesn't apply, Five doesn't apply, six, yes, seven, yes, zero doesn't apply, and nine, I'm oh, sorry, eight doesn't apply, and nine doesn't apply, cool, yeah, three, six, seven. Three, on the other hand, uh, check bit three is going to have five, six, and seven, right, because they all have a one here. One is there, and then the one is here, and then the one is here, so, yeah. Okay, cool, so uh, that's pretty much it. So now we can go ahead and XOR our things to find out what the value of the X bit is. And I'm not going to draw the million XOR symbols. I'm just going to do it quickly here so I don't spend two hours with the example. And so um, let's go ahead and just copy down the value of each thing. So that is a, a 1, a 1, a, a 1, and a 0 for the spots 3, 5, I'm going slow here because I don't want to make mistakes. I don't have you guys on chat to uh, tell me that I'm making a mistake. So I have to be extra meticulous here when I'm copying these things down. And then 567 is just 101 as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's match this again. And then that one is just a zero. Um, oh, that's going to be quite, quite a bit of an issue. So what am I going to XOR it with, actually? Um, I guess a zero. Yeah, we'll say, so I guess we'll, we'll, we'll assume. I think that's what happens when, when you get it. Uh, usually, you don't have a situation like this, because usually you do powers of two, like you got a 16 bits or 32 bits and so on. You don't have a weird situation where you have like five bits, but uh, that's just what we chose. That's the life we chose to follow. So anyways, let's go ahead and XOR the stuff about and hopefully this works. So uh, this will give us a zero, then this will give us a zero again, and finally the innocent give us a one, which is exactly what we expect, because then we get an even number, right? You know, in the test, you're going to be doing it with all of this stuff, but in the back of your mind, you can just double check to make sure that this is actually an even number of ones. That's how you know that things went out correctly. Okay? And so... Uh, from here, we got 101. We should expect to get a zero, but let's see if we do. So this gives us a one, and then the one one gives us a zero. So perfect. This should give us the same as above. And now this was a weird case again. So if you ever have a scenario like this, just add a leading zero or trading zero, which essentially will tell you that this should give you a zero. So Because that actually allows it to keep it even. Because that's, again, what you want. You want to make sure these are even. And there you go. So now that we got the check bit in there, we can go ahead and throw it in. So this is check bit one, and all the other ones are zeros. So there we go, now we got our data. So I guess we'll do again two examples. One of them where we transmit the data and everything is okay. And then the one where we transmit the data and we make an issue. So we will have a typo in spot nine. Or actually, no, not nine. One of them that's shared the most. So like seven, let's do seven. So that'll be nicer. So yeah, so that one has an error. So we, you know, we don't know that, quote unquote. And so uh, to be able to compute this again, we're going to XOR all the combinations. So we're going to do all the XORing here. And uh, the way we're going to achieve that, is the easiest thing is I suppose is just to copy this down. 
So just copy all of these down here, like that. And I just add in, I mean, it doesn't matter technically if you add it in the front or in the back, but uh, we are gonna add it in the front, which is one zero zero zero. So one zero zero zero. Uh, but again, even if you added the check bit at the end when you're doing this sex soaring, again, it doesn't matter what order you 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 run is in in uh, like left or right. So, but just be consistent, you know. Better safe than sorry. Um, so this, of course, should give us a zero because it's an even number. I can already see it, but let's do it. So this gives us a zero. Then a zero and a one will give us a one, but then a one and a one will give us a zero. So yes. This one will give us a zero, one will give us a one, and then one and zero will give us again a one, but then one and one will give us a zero, so that's okay. This will give us the same as the one above it, because it's the same thing. And then this basically zero, zero gives us a zero. So the fact that we got zero, zero, zero means that there is no error, so everything is okay. All right, cool. Now let's do the second example here. In this second example, we are gonna basically do the same systematic thing that we did above it. So we're gonna take all this stuff here. Actually, I don't want to make a mistake, so this time we'll just copy this stuff over. Huh, it's not copy. Stand by. Here we go. So let's copy the values now. So the check bit values are one, zero, zero, and zero. And then we got three, five, seven, nine. So that would be one one zero zero and then three six seven is one zero zero so one zero zero five six seven is one zero zero and then nine is just zero so we're gonna XOR all this together so let's just this one we know is gonna give us a zero and then everything else should basically give us errors of ones so uh, you can prove that by doing this gives you a zero. When you XOR with that, it gives you a one. And then when you XOR with that, it gives you a one. This gives you a one, and then this gives you still a one, and this gives you still a one. This gives you a one, and then this gives you a uh, one again, and the one again, and there you go. So yeah, so basically you get one, 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 zero. But then you do the flip that I said, which is basically this flip right here. And then as you can see, that zero is basically this point out to the error being here. So then we just flip this out to a one. So from zero to one. And that should fix our error, which is indeed what we had as the error. So there you go. This worked. Yay. As a final uh, one, I suppose we can do the uh, one. We can do one error on a parity bit really quickly. So uh, let's do that on, on the on this one just to make things fast. So let's do the error on the last parity bit. So that becomes a one, okay? So in that case, uh, pretty much it's gonna be the same thing that we had above here. Almost the same thing, of course, minus the error part. So except here, the only thing that's gonna change is gonna be this last line. Because now here, this is a zero one. Right, because uh, oh, or sorry, one zero I suppose since the parity bit goes first. Uh, oh well, no, no, but we, we just changed the parity bit to a one, so then we make it a one, so one zero. Okay, so when we do that part, this of course will give us a one. So the location that we get is zero 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 one, but then we do the flipping, the inverse, which gets us one zero zero, and this of course is the location of the check bit. So uh, I try to make it on the same screen, but zoom out. You can see here that uh, that is indeed the location of the error, as you saw. So it works as well on that. So there you go. You got your Hamming code. And uh, here, um, I think uh, on the book, they have an example with 8 bits. So you can see them doing it with the 8 bits here. As you can see, uh, I don't know why they put it backwards, but it's basically the same thing we did with the, the, the five bits, but here they have a couple of extra bits at the end. And uh, as you can see here, the bits that uh, that check bit eight here, the, the fourth check bit would check, would be anything with a one there, which is pretty much all of them afterwards. So all these are gonna be checked by this guy. And so, uh, but however, this one will be checked also with check bit one, 
this one will be checked with check bit two. Uh, this one would also be checked with check bit two, and this will be checked with check bit three because of the one there. So uh, yes, and this is another way of putting everything in one line. But like I said, I think I like I like my method better. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for the rest of the chapter. The, they they do talk about synchronous RAM and asynchronous and the advantages of that, and uh, it's very useful information. I still think you should read it. They also talk about uh, uh, other like potential uh, technologies for memory in the future. Um, where is it at? It's not even in the PowerPoint actually. Interesting. Oh, no, here, well, here at the corner. So the SC, STTT, PC RAM and the RE RAM. It's a little interesting, you know, pretty cool stuff to see what potential future holds for memory. I believe they say that this is the most mature technology of the three that they're showing here. But uh, of course, you know, we want to keep increasing speed of computers. We need to increase all aspects of it and not bottleneck it. And, uh, you know, that includes RAM. So that hopefully gives you a quick overview into RAM. But actually, more importantly, the real focus of this chapter that you really want to make sure you learn is the Hammond code error correction. So because that's very important, not just for memory but communications in general. And it'll kind of lead into the next chapter, which is talking about RAID. So uh, that concludes today's lecture. I hope you all guys have uh, good luck tomorrow. So tomorrow is your test. I'm assuming that you're watching this today, which is Wednesday. But if you are not, uh, if you decided to wait until after the test, then in that case, uh, you better watch it before uh, for Friday because the TA will go over an example of this stuff so it's even better so anyways hope you guys have a good weekend as well and I'll see you guys on Monday's lecture make sure you go to your TA's lecture on Friday thanks for watching bye